May I start by um, complimenting Meat and Livestock Australia on their Australia Day TV advertisement. So, I loved it. First question. In your letter to me dated 27th of October 2021, Mr Strong, you acknowledged the data I quoted in the last Senate estimates from a report published on the CSIRO website titled Australian Cattle Herd, A New Perspective on Structure, Performance and Production, dated 2021, was correctly quoted. I thank you for that and accept Meat and Livestock Australia consider the figure I used is higher than you would use. The lead author of that report, Dr Geoffrey Fordyce, works for Meat and Livestock Australia on your NB2 herd pillar feed-based program. Is that correct? Uh, it cer certainly has. I'm not sure if he's currently contracted Senator, but certainly he has, has worked with us, yes. Definitely. Okay. So my decision to use that data that I used was logical then, wasn't it? Partially, Senator. Um, yes. Thank you. So turning to Meat and Livestock Strategic Plan 2025. You're familiar with that. On page four, this is in your own words, Mr Strong. With a whole of industry strategic plan in place, Red Meat 2030, that's the name of your plan, there is an opportunity for Meat and Livestock Australia to drive transformational change. We have to find ways to support the industry to deliver on its ambitious vision of doubling the value of red meat sales. That's the end of the quote. Could you please specify what percentage of this 100% increase in sales revenue will come from price rises and what percentage will come from sales volume increases? Thank you, Senator. The, the Red Meat 2030 plan is actually the industry plan that was put together by mm -hmm. RMAC. Um, it's a 10-year it's a plan that the industry collectively put together. Our, our five-year plan then fits behind that and we've adopted the, the same overarching goal and the six pillars. It's that got are, your that MLA. That, that's our five-year plan mm -hmm. and it's a, it draws on the Red Meat 2030 plan, which is the broader industry plan. It doesn't specify what component of that growth comes from price or, or volume and um, and it's probably speaking from a, a opinion being involved in that process, but the the setting of that target was to be ambitious uh, for the future of the industry in creating and capturing value, but also making sure that we weren't as an industry limited to price or volume. And the industry over the last 30 years collectively has invested in a significant a range of activities, not just with Meat and Livestock Australia and our R&D and marketing, but in a range of other activities as well, for us to produce a, a higher quality, more consistent, traceable, uh, guaranteed product, but also um, taking advantage of or participating in the, you know, the preferential market access that we also have available to us as well. So there's opportunities for us to increase productivity, but there's also opportunities for us to create and capture more value in higher quality products with where we have preferential access to high quality markets. So it's a combination of both. Senator. Well, pardon me, but it sounds like waffle. Because if, if I, who, who, are you, who are you trying to convince here? Because the farmers, surely, the producers, need to have some kind of faith in, in what, you're, what you're leading. And yet you're telling me, telling me now it's just an ambitious plan with no limit on price or volume. So surely this has all been modelled. Uh, so there's there's a number of things sitting behind it, Senator, but I, I, I think it's quite the opposite to Waffle. It's providing opportunity in multiple areas rather than restricting it to one. So, so hang on. Opportunity comes from knowing something about it. What you're saying is here, we haven't done this. It's an opportunity because it hasn't been modelled. Uh, Senator, the opportunity comes from the investments that the broader industries made over the last 20 or 30 years in having a consistent quality traceable product with a quality assurance program behind it that is being sold at higher prices into markets where we now have preferential access. So, so I, I accept that, but you're still talking very generally because to, to double the value of red meat sales, yeah. you need to increase the price if the, you need to double the, the price if the herd stays flat. If the volume stays the same, so the volume yep. can increase if the herd stays the same size. You can have increased carcass weight or increased yep. productivity. Thirteen percent, your increased carcass weight. Yep. Um, 
Doesn't seem to be any real meat in this. And so, and Senator, there's, a, there's an outcomes report. Oh, sorry. There's an outcomes report, Senator, which actually lay out uh, some of the progress that's already been made. So if you look at something like Meat Standards Australia, which is the eating quality program that last year added an additional $158 million in value to Farmgate um, uh, revenue for producers. And over the last 10 years, that's created more than a billion dollars in value at a Farmgate. So we can share with you the extension um, adoption report, which does actually list out some very specific areas like Meat Standards Australia, like the profitable grazing systems programs and the producer demonstration sites, which have quantified increase in farm gate value, but also increase on a per hectare <coughs> basis of benefit to producers of adopting the things that the industry's invested in. Okay, I'll, I'll accept that, if, if you'd like to send us that. The, um, the fundamental figures, though, are 100% increase in, in value with flat herd, herd size. No, it's not, well, Senator. There's nothing about a flat herd size, and it's 10 years, so it's over a 10-year period. Uh, it's in, uh, doubling the value of red meat sales over a 10-year period. So in the last Senate estimates, we had a difference of opinion on the direction of herd numbers, and we've still got that. Yep. I maintain the only way to meet net, car net zero carbon dioxide targets, why you'd want to meet that is beyond me, because no one's given me any proof. But the only way to meet those targets under Meat and Livestock Australia's CN30 program, Carbon Neutral 30 program, was to hold herd numbers at the historically low numbers experienced during the recent drought. And I'll quote your reply. We are very aware that there have been discussion that things like the carbon neutral goal are reliant on limiting livestock numbers or reducing production or profitability. And we co completely reject those. That's the end of your quote. So I thank you for the answer on notice regarding herd numbers. And now reference the document you sent me A Meat and Livestock Australia publication titled Industry Projections 2021, Australian Cattle July Update. On page four, there are herd numbers. <clears throat> herd size, slaughter and production are all flat, arguably slightly decreasing in the last few years across the period indicated 2000 to 2023 and down from their peak in this period. Am I reading that right? Uh, you may be, Senator. I don't have that one in front of me. But what I can do is provide you with the updated projections from earlier this year, which show the projected increase in, in production and output. So increase in herd size, increase in productivity. We can provide that to you. It so it's a 4% increase, I think, to 27 Yeah, that sounds right. Yes, if so, you could, yeah. please. Yeah, we can certainly do that. So carcass weights, coming back to what you raised earlier on, carcass weights are showing an increase in the bottom graph of 13%. This does in part reflect the work done by Meat and Livestock Australia on genetics, feed base and transport. So that's correct? In part, yes, Senator. In, and only in part? There are other factors involved, are there? Yeah, other factors like the producers' you know, willingness to adopt new technologies, but also I think part of the increase in carcass weight comes from the increase in turnoff through the feedlot sector. Mm -hmm. There's been an increased number of animals come through the feedlot sector as a finishing mechanism in the last year or two, and that also contributes to increasing carcass weight. Either way, it's a good job because 13% is a significant increase in productivity and profitability. Correct. So, page two of this report. The average herd number for cattle for 2016 to 2021 included a substantial drought influence was 26,619, with the best year being 2018 at 28,052. Meat and Livestock Australia's projection for 2022 is 27,223, and for 2023 is 28,039. This is down from the CSIRO's figure of 30 to 40 million before the drought, which was the point that I was making in the last Senate estimates. Even if the CSIRO figure is higher than you would accept, I fail to see an increase here in these figures. And for clarity, I'm still trying to see where the increase in herd numbers component of the 100% increase in red meat production is coming from. Is it true that unless the herd numbers recover to around 30 million, then Meat and Livestock Australia are projecting a permanent reduction in the Australian herd? No, Senator, it's not. So the paper you're referencing is not a CSIRO paper. Um, Dr Fordyce is the lead author and he's mm -hmm. previously worked with CSIRO and it's, and it's 
was present on their publication site, but it's not a it's not a formal CSIRO paper. Um, but that. But he did work side. for you. He did absolutely he did, and and still has done in in a range of different areas. He's been a very prominent um, researcher with the Queensland Department of Primary Industries in Northern Australia, and has done quite a bit of work with MLA and our predecessors. So he's pretty years. competent. Uh, doesn't mean we have to agree on everything, though, does it? So we could also quote other. No, papers, there's got to be so. a reason for not agreeing. Yep. If he's Cer competent, certainly there is. Yeah, um, and but there's also other papers that are. Uh, produced by independent analysts, which say the herd's even smaller than what uh, we project. So even smaller. Yes. Yep. So um, uh, by by private um, you know, commercial analysts, that's that's widely read, that gets quoted to us as much or more than this paper does. But Senator, the herd size isn't the only driver of of productivity. Uh, so being able to, as you say, increase carcass weights, increase mm -hmm. value. Increased productivity. So we'll one of the things that. that Dr. Fordyce has been involved with is the NB2 program that you mentioned, and uh, the ability to increase cows that get in calf, decrease cow mortality, increase calves that survive, and increase weaning weight in reasonably modest levels. Only a couple of percentages decrease in cow mortality, a couple of percentages increase in fertility, um, 10 kilos increase in weaning weight, has a material impact on northern productivity, not just in numbers but also in in value so the herd size is an important number to help us with our you know planning and projections when we look at a range of things but it's only one of the contributors to productivity and and profitability and and to you know, how we get to a doubling of the value for the red meat sector yeah looking at uh, agriculture agricultural producers whether it be livestock or or crops um, there's certainly a huge increase and improvement in the use of science to guide and, and that, that's yeah. become a wonderful productivity improvement tool but it still comes back to basic arithmetic if herd numbers are not growing after allowing for improved carcass weights the only way to increase the value of red meat production by hundred percent after allowing for the 13 percent carcass weight increase is for price increases of 87 percent no senator it's it's not um so last um Chairman Beckett mentioned about our trip to Darwin uh, two weeks ago. And one of the great things we heard about was the use of um, uh, knowledge that's been gained over the last 10 or 20 years by the industry. And there was a couple of fantastic examples of the use of phosphorus as a supplement in phosphorus deficient country. And same herd size, same cow herd size, halving cow mortality and increasing weaning rates by 30%. Same cow herd size, halving cow mortality increasing weaning rates by 30 per cent. So herd size is not the only way and when you think about those ways to make significant improvements in productivity it actually becomes a minor factor. So, so being able to produce more from what we have regardless of what we have and capturing, creating and capturing more value from that is much more important than the herd size. So I accept that it's a laudable goal to increase the productivity, capturing more from what you have. Yeah. So if herd sizes stay flat, then are you able to provide me with the breakdown of where the 100% increase in red meat value will come from? Well, we can provide you, sorry. I'm sorry, Senator Roberts, I've got questions on this. So perhaps if you stick around, we can talk okay. about it. Good, yeah. Okay, I've only got um, two more questions, but, but you can provide that we breakdown. We can provide some. That's not, there's not a, a I would say that's an industry, you know, broader 10 year goal. Um, in our five-year plan, we've laid out a range of, of areas that we're investing in, so we can certainly provide you with, with a range of activities that are currently underway. And like I mentioned before, the outcomes report, which will give you some um, evidence of where that progress is already being shown. So what I'm trying to, just to summarise it, okay? I'm concerned, uh, and hopefully your figures will alleviate that concern, I'm concerned that what you're relying upon is a huge increase in price, which will hurt the consumer. Um, and the second thing I'm concerned about is why this is being done. So let's, let's listen to the chair's questions. Let's get the figures from you. And my last two questions. I acknowledge from your letter, reduction in carbon dioxide production of 53% since 2000 by the Australian red meat industry. Again, there's, there's never been any evidence produced that carbon dioxide needs to be cut. 
from human activity. This has been driven by measures that are now in place. How will you get the other 47 percent other than calling the permanent herd reduction numbers a net zero measure? <coughs> So there's a range of things already underway, um, and a couple that we can point to straight away uh, is uh, feed supplements, for example. So there's two good examples of that. Changing the nature of feed supplements? No, ad additional feed supplements that will go into a ration, for example. So the red asparagopsis seaweed product, which has been demonstrated to reduce uh, the production of methane by more than 90 per cent. And there's also a synthetic version of the same type of component, which, which, which so far is demonstrating the same type of effect. So feed supplements are certainly a, a, a key opportunity in reducing the amount of methane being produced. Um, one of the other areas is, relates to the things we've just been talking about, is increasing productivity from the herd that we, we have, so through improved genetics, um, improving productivity through the things we were just talking about. So there's, there's a number of areas in addition to um, a, st a stable herd, which are already largely proven and underway, and we've, you know, we're only a couple of years in to you know, the path to 2030. The last question. WWF in America has been on a concerted campaign to kill the beef industry. The same organisation is doing the same here in this country, and, and, and cattle grazers have told me that. So there's a lot of pressure on the, on the beef industry itself, its very existence, for political reasons, not economic or scientific reasons. Do you, as the MLA, just accept the mantra that we need to cut the carbon dioxide produced by humans or human activity? Or do you actually have scientific justification for accepting that? It's not, it's not our position to enter into that discussion, Senator. Do so um, you accept it? I, it's not the environment to have a position either way. Um, this is an industry goal which is ambitious, but what's really important is that we don't think about CN30 in the absence of profitability, productivity and intergenerational sustainability. So there's nothing that we're doing or investing in that doesn't have a lens on profitability and productivity of the industry uh, at the same time as thinking about its impact on the environment. I would um, beg to differ because it seems to me that you need to have a sound rationale for why you're doing these things, and I have yet to see any proof of that. Uh, you know, seaweed, feeding that to cattle, feed supplements, surely there's a cost in there. Uh, you're asking farmers to change their practices, which could increase cost further. Um, so it seems like the doomsayers that have been hitting our electricity sector, our transport sector, our, our regulatory sector are now hitting our agricultural sector. In All many, right, many so ways. Question, Senator Roberts? No, that's a statement. Statement? <laughs> Terrific. All right. Good note to finish on. Thank you very much, Mr. Strong.